Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Peace and love everybody. I'm Brother Ali. It's a Traveler's Podcast. Thank you for coming back. We appreciate you. Man, this episode is one that I've been looking forward to. Uh, Tef Poe is an incredible hip-hop artist and a genuine community organizer, a real activist, a real revolutionary, uh, somebody who is deeply connected to the streets who really comes out of the culture and the community of the black lived experience in St. Louis. St. Louis is one of the most uh, racist and segregated and just really deeply, the, the, the organization and the compounded power of white supremacy in St. Louis is just really felt in a way that's very unique. And so we'll hear Tef Poe talking about his development in that kind of environment and the way that he came up. And, you know, so his music is incredible as an artist. Like he's just made really, really dope music. You know, he comes, I've always seen him as somebody that comes from the Dead Prez um, lineage, and, and which I think also includes Tupac and it includes early Ice Cube and it uh, includes certain elements of Ice-T and certain elements of N.W.A., but I would say, um, you know, Public Enemy and there's some scar faces in there and, you know, just a very real cultural uh, revolutionary spirit of truth-telling and of just the connection that, I mean, also is connected to Malcolm X, you know, this feeling, this reality of like the people that have been... Uh, structurally and systematically and historically pushed out of healthy ways to build and develop community and build economics and you know every every attempt to do something positive uh, from a black historical perspective has just been met with like I said really um, demonic and organized um, uh, the the full weight and power of the American system has come down around destroying this stuff. All of the positive means by which to build and maintain community. And this is not just me saying this, but I mean, if you look at the counterintelligence program of the FBI, um, you know, that was, that was in place to break up organizations, to, to break up black communal organizations, you know, that they, they always kind of look at and say, well, you know, from a respectable perspective, Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and the Black Panthers and people like that, the Nation of Islam, that they were, you know, those are the bad guys and they don't do it right, you know. And then you have the respectable ones like Dr. Martin Luther King and Core and SNCC and like these are the people that are doing it right and they're respectable. But the reality is that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and the counterintelligence program was working with to to undermine and destroy all of those communal organizations. They said that we're here to, in their own language, to eradicate the possibility of a black messiah. And you say like, well, what is a messiah? A messiah is somebody who comes with the loving, righteous message that brings people together and unites them on a common accord. You know what I'm saying? And, and you have these laws like RICO laws and things like that that basically say like anytime people come together to organize around doing something positive for the community, that's seen in a, in, a, in a historical context in America, structurally, governmentally, society, culturally, it's seen as a negative thing that, that the entire force of the most powerful nation on earth has to break that up. And they've done it through all sorts of means, you know, uh, trying to get people hooked on drugs, infiltrating these organizations, sending, you know, undercover agents in, you know, the, the people that were one of Malcolm X's bodyguards was actually a government informant the, the day that he was murdered at the, at the Audubon ballroom. Uh, you know, letters were written between uh, pho phony letters were written between uh, different factions of, of different black organizations to make sure that they uh, fostered dissent between them and made them fight each other. This is what the government of the United States has done. So you look at that and then you also look at, you know, culturally what's been done to, to black artistic expression 
in in uh in America and in the the world of white power of white supremacy you know that these amazing voices come along and they're co-opted and they're bought out and uh appropriated and systematically what's been done over time and it continues until this very day all of these different exp- and then also what was done with uh the, you know the influx of drugs that were pumped into black communities and then the the ways of policing and prison and punitive kind of um you know what they called criminal justice but was actually just breaking people breaking and destroying communities and destroying families and so all of these and then even if you look at the the ways that black communities built uh positive legal legit uh, economic power through business districts that came up immediately after slavery was over. You see black communities building, um, you know, entire business districts and school systems and their own press and their own everything positive to sustain communal human life. They built the, all of those things and continued to do them. And time and time again, they were just destroyed. You know, people have, are just now starting to learn about the Tulsa race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The the basically a, a black business community was bombed. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you look at what was done in Philadelphia and really all across America. And and so in some places they were done like that. In other places, like in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, for example, there was a black business district and community called Rondo that was very successful, even for being a really small community, very successful. And the government came in and just built Highway 94 directly through that that district and broke it up. So all of these positive things that have happened in, in Black communal life to, to create possibilities and opportunities, you know, this is the part that isn't talked about. We talk about Black history. It's like, first of all, we never talk about Africa and we act like Black history starts in slavery. Well, like if you're starting in slavery, then everything after that is just, it's constant upward motion. And it also, this idea that like you by nature are a slave, you know what I'm saying? So we don't really talk about Africans being the creators of civilization and of learning and of mathematics and of science and of culture and of you know religion and all of the beautiful things, poetry and philosophy and all of these things that have enriched and given meaning to human life and also allowed for human beings to live, all of this stuff. But these are the things that are left out of the story. But what has always been allowed to flourish in uh, in this white supremacist environment is black criminality. That's the one thing that America needs. Like this structure needs that because people need their drugs. You know what I'm saying? People need their, their uh, sex workers. People need their gambling. People need their whatever it is that we're, that, that people are going to need, the vices of of the of the the society and so uh black criminality has always played a necessary role in that world you know what i'm saying so there has always been that element and i say all of this to really just you know i'm we're setting up this conversation with our brother tef poe because the the community that tef poe comes out of is one that makes a lot of sense to me these are the people that raised me it's just that you know my way of expressing it is going to be different both because of the body that i'm in being a descendant of europe and then there's confusion about that because people are because i'm albino and people are confused about what that means and i can't be i can't claim that i'm never confused about what that means for me um, but then also the reality that most of a lot of the people that listen to me are white and are listening to me because they're like, that's a white guy like me. So, so much of, of the way that I present myself is me trying to, to do the right thing within that, you know, but Tefpo comes from a legacy and a lineage, both in culture and in life and in music that just really blends the lived realities of of uh, black genius of all forms in the wilderness of North America, in the tragic tension of living in an anti-black and white supremacist reality, a structural reality. And so what you hear in his music is that type of coming together of different elements of life in hip hop music, in the voices of Ice Cube and 
in the voices of, uh, of dead prez and in the voices of, you know, so I've always seen him in that cultural dead prez. One time there's the language, the RBG dead prez really promoted this idea of revolutionary, but gangster, you know what I'm saying? That, uh, this, this coming together, this meeting place of the world and the community as we would like it to be and the reality of things as they actually are. And in moving the ball and in actually having the ability to impact the lived experience of people, it, that has to happen in the real world. And so this this kind of um, binary world of good and evil and good, you know, wrong and right, those things do get a little muddy sometimes. And so for the Muslims listening to this and for others, you know, Tef Poe is also a Muslim, so that you're going to hear where all of these different worlds come together. The reality that, you know, street life is very much a part of lived life. The same way that like if you're in a community where most people are, I'm, and sorry to, to go to something that might feel like a stereotype, you know, but I have friends that are from Boston, Irish cats from Boston that are like, yes, yeah, so many of us were, were taught to be police officers and firemen. You know what I'm saying? And that's a, that, like, I'm sorry for the fact that that's also a stereotype. But if you are Irish and, and you're in a certain part of like South Boston, the idea of being in the Irish mafia, the idea of working for the city, the idea of being a, these are all different parts of just your life, your lived experience, the way that you do life because of the community that you live in and the, the different influences and opportunities of life there. That's what we experience in the inner city and the place where hip hop is born and continues to live and give life to the world in the place where uh, the revolutionary spirit is in a place where the spirit of uh, Islam is, and particularly, you know, black expressions of it, black American expressions of Islam. So yeah, I just said a mouthful, but I mean, that's like, how do you even set up a conversation for somebody like Tef Po? So me and Tef, um, well, first of all, let me just say something else about him. Tef was, has been a dope MC for a long time. He's been a community person for a long time. You'll hear his influences and things. But when the world really started to take notice of Tef Poe was when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson by the police. And not only was he killed, but his body was just left uh, out in the open for hours after that. And Tef Poe is somebody who was a, a prominent person, a known person in the community and had a voice because of who he is as a, an artist and as a community organizer and leader. He really, um, there, that was an opportunity um, for him to be seen in the picture of who he actually is because he was able to bring people together. He was also able to understand the different elements of the community and to be able to speak to them and speak for them. And so you'll see if you look in that Michael Brown Ferguson moment, you'll see, um, you know, Tef Poe speaking out in that moment and just being very present and very very present with what is and very present with who he is. And so we've always kind of like known each other and we've always communicated with each other. And every time we speak, it's just always some like um, brother, man, I love and respect you so much. I really, my intention is to get, be close to you. I want to work with you. I want to be around you. And we've made a bunch of attempts to do that. But honestly, this is one of our first times really sitting down and being able to just build for a couple hours together. And so I'm really grateful to be able to do that. This is an episode I've really been looking forward to. And um, hope you enjoy it. We're brought to you, as always, by the Zakat Foundation and by BetterHelp Online Mental Health Therapy Platform. This is a good one. <laughs> this is a good one. Enjoy this episode of the Traveler's Podcast. Man, I'm happy to finally talk to you, brother. How you feeling? Yeah, I'm good, man. Uh, I, I can't complain. I can't complain. People ask a lot about this kind of like confluence between art and politics and spirituality. I mean, for me, that's those are the areas that that really all come together, you know, very clearly in this culture of ours. But so for you personally, 
where where were those kind of like early seedlings? Like, were you thinking culturally, you know, thinking about, we all started to know about you during the Mike Brown time. I already knew your music before that, but we started to understand the leader that you were around that time. Um, but I'm wondering before that, what was your understanding of the relationship in your own self between being the person on the microphone that's giving the, the being the voice of the streets and also being the source of information to the streets. And then uh, the, the way that the art and culture came together with the political part. Oh uh, man. So nineties hip hop, man. Um, mm -hmm. Me and my boy Rockwell Knuckles, legendary, super legendary St. Louis MC is like the, the Raekwon to my ghost face, basically. Uh, he, uh, we were just talking and he was, really breaking, we were just having a really interesting conversation about late 90s hip hop. And uh, there's a, a new interview from MC Search with Mav Hoffa where uh, Search was uh, talking about a specific period of hip hop that he felt was drastically overlooked by historians and fans and, and such and such. Uh, and I believe he was talking about 89 to about uh, 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I find interesting is that I, I could find some um, resonation within that those comments because as I think about my consciousness as a person who was coming up into uh, my own being as a person in the 90s, uh, for me, it, it didn't start to click until about 1996. You know what I'm saying? That's my, you get, you get an MC like myself from from 96 to about 2001 that's when somebody like me is in the oven you that's when you have your uh you know uh pockets getting pockets killed big is killed the emergence of, of dmx the emergence of uh the movie belly uh and and, and 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 a lot of times we have folks who aren't really hip-hop people in the media talking about hip-hop so the cultural connectors uh, that would pull people like myself into the culture don't get fully uh, expounded upon. But you think about a, 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 a kid like me being in high school with a movie like Belly is being out and they got Nas in there talking about going back to Africa. <laughs> we always, my, my wife always laughs at that because she's like, where in Africa are they going? It, like, it's, it's so wild. It's, it's, it's like, yo, I'm going back to Africa. It's like, yo, it's a trillion countries in Africa. Dude, bro. you could go to Egypt. You could go to South Africa. But it's funny. Like, <laughs> yeah. she always says, like, she just imagined him walking up to the counter at the, at the airport. And, Two tickets to Africa, please. <laughs> <laughs> yo, I'm going to just go to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But even even that joke, right? Like the education that's attached to that opportunity. Right, right, right. For somebody like me. The, just these moments are sparking my inquisition into self in a in a new type of way. And uh, you know, so I give a lot of who I credit for who I am to that time period of the culture. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and and just even uh, and it's funny because now in the Instagram era of things, the social media era of things, uh, you're right. We people would would really interrogate a lot of this this stuff a lot deeper, right? Like if you really think about Wu Tang Clan coming out just boldly being like, "Yo, we calling each other God." We we're doing like the we're at the apex of hip hop. We're we're like where the Migos are considered today in, in in terms of popularity, fame, accolades in the mainstream machinery. And y'all are on TV straight dropping Islamic jewels, calling each other God. You know, like, like yo, this is crazy. This mm. is crazy. And I don't think a lot of people really unpack how that affected the children who were really soaking that in. Because I wasn't just listening to the music. I was studying this right. stuff. Right. I'm from Missouri, so I'm, I'm not from New York. I'm not from uh, L.A. I'm from the middle of nowhere. So in order to really fully understand this and get away with putting this this costume on at the time, I had to really know what was going on. So that, I think that music really shaped my politics. It shaped my understanding of the world, and it shaped my principles. I leaned back into to the, the, the artists uh, from that area, my teachers in my life, like some of the greatest teachers I ever had, honestly. Were you, was your family Muslim or did you become, or did you convert to Islam? Uh, I converted. Um, but I also, you know, I have my own weird beliefs about that. Um, I grew up 
in a strong Christian household, strong Pentecostal Christian household. We really, we couldn't listen to hip hop. We couldn't dance. We couldn't do none of it. It was really intense and sometimes. But once again, I'm growing up in the, in the, in the nineties, man. You know, Minister Louis Farrakhan is still active in that mm-hmm. part of time. People like uh, Dr. Khalid Mohammed, he's yes. still active in that part of time. Um, the undertones of uh, Ice Cube and his relationship with the Nation of Islam, those those things were still resonating in, in, you know, in the subversiveness of my consciousness, just from different things I might interact with casually. And also just my, um, I wasn't raised by my biological father, uh, but he, he named me Kareem Farrakhan. So um, I've always felt in terms of my connection to Islam, um, I have a bit of an ancestral uh, right to passage to, to all that, all of that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether I choose to adopt that knowledge as my personal doctrine is up to me, but uh, through the technicality of birth and, and lineage and DNA and, and who I actually am on a universal level, uh, I was already born that. Uh, it was just, uh, I just, I just was born into a situation where I had to go do some extra steps to receive the knowledge of what it, what, what my actual birthright was and uh, who I was actually connected to and who, uh, what was the actual name of the God and the, uh, the, the, the religious rituals and so forth and so forth. But uh, I just wasn't born in a world where they were going to give me that freely without me doing my own research and going through my own struggles to find it. What, who were the people that that taught you, like when, when you did convert and when you did come in, did you have like a particular like association or crew or masjid or like what was the... Yeah, uh, it's, it's crazy. It was a series of people, man. Um, it's a whole story attached to it, to be honest with you. Um, I... Uh, Man, my life is a wild roller coaster of things happening, and then I just embrace what makes sense to me when it happens. Right. Uh, once again, I've always been a student of, um, somewhat of a, a student of the, the nation of gods and earths. Mm-hmm. They've always had a strong presence in our neighborhood. Different people in my community in St. Louis uh, come from that community. And that was one of the strong Islamic communities that was around us at that time as children and young men. You know, a lot of people know Nelly is from St. Louis, but they don't know that uh, Nelly is actually a, a member of the Nation of Gods and Earth, or was at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of his knowledge of how he started moving in the music industry came from that community as well, different brothers who had sparked him and so forth. So I always had brothers who were um, sprinkling Islamic game, I felt, into our minds through that faction. But also in a more practical way, uh, I believe my, my biological father being a bit of a very intriguing person. He was a Christian in, in technicality, but in practice, I believe he was a Muslim mm. because uh, he gave us all Islamic names. I have a brother mm. named Rashid Abdullah and uh, I have a sister named Aisha. My father was a, a pro-black individual who didn't have parents. Um, his parents passed away when he was a very young age. He uh, is a very interesting person because he didn't, he was, a, he, he sold drugs, but he wasn't, uh, he didn't invent crack cocaine, but he did definitely in this area play a role in um, the metamorphine of it from a practical drug to something that people could utilize to make money. And he did that at a very, 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 very young age. Uh, he worked at a pancake house as a manager. And then a white guy brought him a, a rock and he took it home to his sister. And uh, before I was born, he had made a, a million dollars cash off of this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother tells me stories of watching money machines break and they have to go get another one. And the first time he counted that much money, he couldn't believe he did it. But the thing about my father that was interesting in like the, the average person in that position, and I really remember this, the little bit of time that I was around him as a kid is that he was uh, a bit of a political hippie type of guy. He wasn't like your average like guy doing this. Mm. He uh, he was into music. He was into art. Uh, we could go in the living room and basically listen to whatever album we wanted. He had like a, a record store in the living room. Um, he didn't have like a trillion different automobiles. You know, he's the type of dude that would wear the same thing every day. We rode bikes uh, and, 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 you know, just regular bicycles to make some of the moves he was making. The few little jewels that I did get from him. I remember him telling us, me and my, my brothers, my older brothers, you know, I don't do this to, whether I agree with this statement or not, I remember this was his logic. 
I don't do this to hurt our people. I'm doing this to feed our family. And actually, I refuse to even sell this to our people. Most of my clientele is wealthy white folks or white business owners. And I can remember busting moves with him as a, as a youngin in the backseat. He'll go pull up on the mayor's house. He'll go go to this person's house. He'll go to this person's house. So there was always a subversive mentality mm -hmm. that I believe was, was aiming in, in this general direction in my life. The, the, the real person, there's two people that I will credit in closing to this answer, because I never even really fully talked about this. Uh, there's a few people, my boy Bassam, who lived with me in North St. Louis during the Ferguson uprising. Um, a lot of people in my crew, we've been knowing Bassam since he was 16 years old. Some people have been knowing him before then. We never really made a distinction uh, of him being, you know, the Muslim, a, a Arab, Palestinian brother in the clique. For us, he was just another dude from around the way. Yeah, he used to talk to us about his culture and his religion and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, it did, it wasn't this really, you know, obtuse thing to us. It was just the norm. It was normal. He right. was he was Muslim, but to us, he was also uh, a North Side Rolling Sixty Crip. You know what I mean? Like he, he, the, the, some people may not understand how those worlds overlap or why they overlap, but that's truly who he was. Yeah. So, um, he was able to show you the, the power of, of, of God. He was able to quintessentially evangelize so many of us into an understanding of Islam mm -hmm. through his basic functionality of being a member in our community, the way he moved, the, the different things his family had got involved in. His father brought one of the first gang troops to our community. Uh, and, you know, um, th he ju they just accumulated a certain type of respect in that neighborhood, and, but never changed who they were at all. So th uh, that was very interesting to me. And he was one of the first people to really uh, push me in, into a, that, that area of understanding in a, in a post-Ferguson world, after Ferguson. You know, the one of the early teachers that I had when I became Muslim was this old school. He was a sign painter by profession, but his name was Abdul Musawir. And he was originally from St. Louis. He he became joined the Nation of Islam oh, wow. in St. Louis back in the day. Uh, Nation his, strong. Man. Yeah, strong, man. man. So his son is Nick Muhammad, who if you don't know Nick Muhammad, like you have to. Like you and Nick Muhammad are like, might have opposite sides of the same locket. He's a street yeah. brother, amazing artist, amazing community organizer, activist. And that was his stepfather. And um, Musa Weir was really close to me, passed away. But he told me when I was 15 and first became a Muslim, he was like, man, don't ever get it twisted. He said his opinion was that the most racist, the most, uh, the most um, segregated, the most oppressive place in the United States, he believed that it was St. Louis. Oh. So I, I like I came up with that. I mean, can you like just give us some Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Give us some of the backdrop and the landscape oh, of, of God, St. Man. Louis, man. Man, so even before I take one step forward, I do gotta shout out one of my guys, man. This, now this brother really did play a huge role in bringing me to the, the scope of Islam. Mm. Uh St. Louis MC by the name of Spade Ripper. Mm. A lot of people on paper might look at Spade and be like, Spade is not a Muslim, bro. Like, what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, they just, the, the guy, the person that they know of him, they may be like, there's no chance. But truth be told, people in St. Louis, their wigs would, would really flip if they, if they really knew that. But I was leaving a liquor store one day of all things, man. And I was really going through it at this point because mm. uh, I had made some um, rough decisions with... Uh, the things that we were building on the ground and stuff was starting to kind of collapse up under me. Mm -hmm. Different businesses was closing, um, just different fractures and different things. I think my father might have actually passed away at this point or was passing away. And uh, I was at the point where, you know, I was about to be evicted. Long story, not so short, man. I'm leaving the, the doggone liquor store mm -hmm. and I bump into uh, this older brother that, uh, uh, named Firewater. That's what we call him, Firewater. Mm. Uh, his family is a, a black and Arab family that, that started this uh, uh, masjid in North St. Louis eons ago. Once again, these cats don't look like the most devout Muslims. This, you know, mm -hmm. this dude got tattoos all over his face. We're both leaving the liquor store. You know what I'm saying? But he he, he talks to me real quick. We dap up. Wah, wah, wah. We keep it moving. 
he tells Spade Ripper that he bumped into me at the liquor store. Spade goes, why you ain't invite him to Jamal? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I ain't even know, you know, like he was like, you, you bumped in the pole at the liquor store. Why you ain't invite him to come pray with us, man? So I start mobbing out with these brothers, praying every Friday um, and just learning and engaging about how to be active in my, uh, my spiritual process. I get back to the apartment. I talked to Spade and uh, something compelled me to, to, to pray. Hmm. I started praying more and more uh, under the doctrine of Islam. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to see the actual uh, comfort come to the situation. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't asking for the solution that I, I wanted to manifest. I was just at ease with the process that I was going through mm -hmm. at that Man, moment. Yeah, brother. So it just made a lot of sense to me in ways that uh, brought healing to the situation for me, you know. And uh, moving forward, I just knew that I was, I was different in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you were talking about the brother having knowledge of self and being able to share it and being able to help other people be, you know, grow and you know, and really develop and heal, like so many of our people like that, we're also in street life. Because of the fact that, like, if you if you're in a certain sector of the of American society, you do not have access to certain other things. So it's like, you know, the the reality that whatever part of life you live in, you're going to engage, especially if you want to be a person, especially if you're the kind of person that's that has leadership potential, that people listen to you, you're able to to influence other people, and you're able to to move things around if you have a certain proclivity to power. Like, man, you're going to engage on, on those levels. You know what I'm saying? Even when you talk about pops, like, you know, being engaged in the street economy and things like that. It's like, yeah, ideally, we would like to not have, we would like to have clean hands, you know, but the, the, in, on, in reality, most of us have been influenced by and taught by people who were navigating the, the different areas of gray within life and just trying to get to the best conclusion at every moment. And, you know, especially when we look at like hip hop culture, like hip hop culture being the language of revolution for disenfranchised people all over the world. And it also yeah. is the most relevant voice of, of Islam, yeah. particularly black Islam. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the, 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 the way that even Islam is being spread around the world, like you said, from the time of the early East Africans until now is like the the voice of Bilal, the the black voice in the world, speaking yeah. to the realities of, you know, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, this this white teacher that I love to death. Sometimes he says political things that I'm just like, what are you talking about, sir? But when he's talking about Dean, I I, I couldn't love anybody more than this guy. He said, he was like, uh, I don't read the Times, talking about the news. I don't read the Times, I read the Universals. Like, mm. man, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, there are going to be things that happen in the moment, but being connected to the, these, like, larger universal arcs of reality and, like, we say, like, who's who's actually pointing us towards meaning? Who's reminding us of who we are, the best of who we are? Who's giving us uh, the imagination to, to, to be something, you know, larger than what this society says we are? A lot of times, man, it's people who are engaging the world as it is. And so they're not moving through this thing clean. Right, right, right. And that's that that connects the whole story though to, mm. to the original question about St. Louis. Yeah. Is this is a city where you gotta get your hands dirty to survive, man. Mm, mm, um, mm, 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 mm. There is no uh no clean way through it for real that you're really engaging the elements in a certain particular way. Uh, uh, and, and I think, uh, so I grew up in the height of the craziness. It didn't really get back as crazy as it was when I was growing up until pretty much recently. Uh, but I grew up in the, the era where the gangs were being infused into St. Louis. Uh, if you know anything about St. Louis, it's a strong Crips and Bloods town in the mm -hmm. 90s. Uh, you know, it's a reason DJ Quick came here and made that song, Just Like Compton. Yeah, because, that and the Ice Cube uh, Summer Vacation. Yep, St. Louis went the cornerback. Uh, <laughs> that was real, yo. Um, mm -hmm. 
this is the world I grew up in. It's a, it's a bit of a southern town, but it's, it's, it's Midwestern centric. But we're three hours from Memphis. Uh, we're not Midwest like Chicago. We're not Midwest like Detroit. We're not Midwest like Cleveland. Uh, it's a it's, it's a slave state type of Midwest. Um, it's a slow, uh, muddy, hot. The summers are very hot and the winters are very cold. Uh, Mississippi River goes right through the heart of the city. And, you know, they don't really use it for a lot of recreational things. It's an industrialized river when it comes to here. Mm -hmm. um, in 19, the early 1900s, there was a big race riot uh, in East St. Louis. Um, and hundreds of black people were killed. Uh, so you grow up hearing stories from black folks who were from East St. Louis, which is across the river in Illinois. Totally different city than St. Louis. Right. Uh, but a lot of people didn't understand that. They think, y'all, you could just drive or walk right into East St. Louis. Now you got to cross the Mississippi River. So, uh, but that means it's a different governance, different everything over there. So uh, back then they were killing folks, uh, shooting them in the head, you know, burning down their homes and, and sh boarding them up, setting the houses on fire and bur bur burning them inside. If they managed to get out the house, they shoot you dead in the head you know, on your own property. Uh, kill hundreds of people uh, on some um, Oklahoma City, Black Wall Street type levels. It mm -hmm. really got swept under the rug. Um, so, you know, I come up in a world where uh, our Caucasian counterparts are the people who, uh, the descendants of the folks who did that. That's right. That's right. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. Um, also, uh, we have this thing called the Veil vale Prophet Society that, Growing up, I was always taught never to publicly speak about the Veil Prophet Society. I've never uh, heard about that. Uh, the Veil Prophet Society is basically a, and you can Google this, uh, it's called the VP Society. They've tried to change the name and hide over the course of years, but it's really a very powerful conglomerate of uh, corporate people in the state of Missouri. Uh, they used to be very, very, very extremely pro-white. Uh, now one would argue that they're just pro-money, but with them being pro-money, they, they appear to be very, very pro-white. Uh, it's a ritualistic organization that praises a uh, created uh, prophet by the name of Corzon. Or I don't know if I'm saying the name right, uh, but uh, they have a lot of political power in the town as well. You'll see their names casually written on buildings, uh, see the, you know, the name casually on the highway, uh, my grandparents, my parents, growing up, whenever we interacted with anything that had their name on it, my parents would tell us, this is not for us. Do not touch it. Stay away from it. Basically, they would say that this is the Klan. Mm. Um, so uh, in the, the public sector of business in, in the state of Missouri, you'll find different CEOs of different companies. They're members of the Vail Profit different uh, actors and actresses that come out of the state of Missouri, they'll be members of it. These people became a very rogue political force. Uh, I do a lot of reading. A book written by the, the guy that the government says killed Martin Luther King. He's from Alden, Illinois, which is 15 minutes from my house. And uh, he was speaking about how um, he, he it couldn't have been him that killed King because there were members of the, the Vail Prophet Society that had, uh, the FBI knew had put $50,000 on Martin Luther King's head. Um, if you go to see the uh, Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, uh, you'll see on certain placards that it'll say that the FBI was looking for shooters that could have came from St. Louis in the King assassination. Mm -hmm. So I grew, I grew up in a place where these type of people govern and they still govern. Um, our police chief uh, that we were combating during Ferguson, he was a member of the Veil Prophet Society. Mm. There's different, and this sounds very conspiracy theory driven, but this is the stuff that we grow up here in this town acknowledging does exist mm -hmm. and the rest of the world may not even know about. So, you know, but but I'm saying all this to say. The Veil Prophet. How world come I've never, how, how have I been in hip hop for, for 30 years? I know nothing about the Veil Prophet. Well, the, like, I feel like this should be like a. Of, the rappers that come out, the Saint, out of St. Louis, besides me and some of the guys I know, they ain't going to touch it. Mm -hmm. So I see all that to say, man, I'm living in a world with the Veil Prophet. Right. 
Rogue Police, Crips and Bloods. Uh, we got what we call mo. We call them Moes, but it was really uh, Moors. But they we used to call them Moes. Yeah. Uh, they were basically, for all intents and purposes, they own street gang. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I've grown up in this world where all these it's just a lot of hyper criminality in St. Louis with a lot of segregation and a lot of. Uh, uh, unacknowledgement of the fact that the civil rights movement did not stop in St. Louis, Missouri and have a successful go at it. Uh, Martin Luther King wasn't embracing these parts, in part because institutions like the Vail Prophet were already organized when he came here. Uh, uh, Tupac was jumped here. You know what I'm saying? Biggie was booed here. Uh, this is a place where uh, the rebel spirit just rage is a little different. We talk about it every week, and that's because the Zakat Foundation, Z-A-K-A-T Foundation, has just been supportive of us from the very beginning. And I've been connected with them and uh, particularly with our sister Amna Mirza for a long time. And, you know, it, Zakat is the pillar in Islam that deals with giving and all spiritual traditions and all every idea of what it is to just be a good person. Uh, has an element that like you've got to give, you have to be generous and you have to give to people who have less than you have. And no matter where you're at in the world, one of the beautiful spiritual practices is always to to find somebody that you have something, that you have more than them of something and then share that thing with them. You know, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it can be as much as a smile. You know what I mean? Like maybe you're the poorest person in the world, but you come across some or in your environment but you can come across somebody that is just experiencing a life without joy. They're not connected to gratitude. Sometimes the more we have, the less joy we have. The more we have in our hand, the less we're able to access what's in our heart. You know, it's just a reality. And so he said a smile is charity in that case. And so, you know, finding people that we're able to share something with is really important. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also said that when we're looking at spirituality, if we're comparing ourselves to other people, and it's a, not a great practice to do. You know, uh, somebody said comparison is the killer of joy. But it is part of what we do as human beings. We compare ourselves to each other. And that's part of what this podcast is about, is like really celebrating people and finding things to admire in other people. It's part of this this idea. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if you're looking at people, if you're going to look at other people, when it comes to somebody's spirituality, their righteousness, their virtue, their beauty as a human being, uh, their just their power and their their beauty and their their regality, their dignity, their goodness, their grace, you know, the the beauty that they are internally. If we're going to look at other people, look at people that are better than you and have more than you in that way. So like try to be around people that are further along in their practice than you are, you know, and those are the people you should look at because it'll always keep you striving and it'll always keep you humble and always keep you wanting to grow as a person. But when it comes to material things, focus on people and look at people that have less than you. Spend time with them. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, sit with them and grow love with them and, and really connect with them, not just throw money at them and be like, oh yeah, I did something good, but actually be with people and live life with people and enjoy life with people that have less than you. And in this culture, we do the opposite. We're really focused on people who have more than us. We're always looking at people that you know, live these crazy affluent lifestyles, and or at least it looks like they do. And those people, a lot of times reality TV and social media, the the influencers that we follow, a lot of times those people have, they they display less than stellar character in public. 
you know what I'm saying? But they seem to have everything in the world. That's the opposite of what we should be doing. Zakat is based on all of these ideas that I'm talking about. It's based on purifying what we have. The fact that it's, the reality is that us going out into the world and doing business means we're going to brush up against stuff that we don't believe in. And sometimes money that's connected to stuff that we don't believe in is going to end up in our coffers, in our account, in our pocket, in, under our bed, in our shoebox, in our safe. You know what I'm saying? It's just, that's the reality of it. So by giving, these are the ways that we try to, 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 to circumvent that. You know what I mean? That's what Zakat is about. And Zakat Foundation operates all over the world where there are people who are in need. And it connects people that have something to share with people who have a need. And they do it in ways that are really creative and really beautiful. And if you listen to this podcast, you've heard me talk a lot about it. But go to, on social media, follow them, Zakat, Z-A-K-A-T-U-S on social media. And then if you can check out their website, zakatfoundation.org. They do amazing stuff all over the world and I can't recommend them more highly. Uh, so we're grateful to be rocking with them. Go and find a campaign that actually looks good to you and just contribute to it. You could do something as small as $5. You could do something you, you, for 50 bucks a month. You could support an orphan and all $50, every penny of it goes to, directly to the children that you're supporting. Really dope stuff. So we're very grateful to be rocking with the Cop Foundation, and we ask that you find something to support and be part of their great work. Coming from St. Louis, Miles Davis was one of the greatest musicians of all time. You know what I mean? And he talked a lot about, like his father during the segregation time was the most popular and like well-to-do black dentist. You know what I'm saying? So he grew up with money and land yeah. and all of this stuff, and he's like, man, Aha, there it is, man. Woo! That's my joy. This man. book is crazy. This is a crazy book. You you could pick you could pick up that book and open it to any chapter. And as many times as you go through it, you're gonna find something new. Man, Miles is one of my uh you want to talk about one of my influences, man. That's mm. uh as a person from St. Louis, and I'm not from East St. Louis, so so for St. Louis people, that's a real big thing, you know what I'm saying? Understood. East St. Louis people feel okay. like, yo, we East St. Louis, y'all St. Louis. But once again, me being me, I, I live in a world where, yo, I'm like, yo, we all the same thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm always bringing, that's my job. I'm always bringing things that the, the society say, you shouldn't be bringing those doctrines together. Nah, dog, I'm going to bring them together. So right. uh, I look at Miles Davis a lot like I look at myself, a person who was from an area who had a talent, had a gift. And he had to figure out how to get up out of here. And he got up out of here. And he had a, a heck of a story to tell behind it. And uh, uh, I, I, Miles is just a, a, a tall standing example for me. When I look at uh, Miles, I feel like as a person from here, I'm seeing things that people from here don't see about him. The demeanor, the, 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 the reason he doesn't talk a lot, might be, some people might think is, oh, for this or that, is actually because he's a country boy. And it's only so much of... Uh, uh, covering up the slur that you can do when you're supposed to be that big. You know what I'm saying? It's, mm. it's, I just see him as, I understand Miles in a very unique way that makes him, uh, I understand his genius on a, on a commercial level for, for, for people who love music in the world diaspora, but as a person who is indigenous to the soil that he comes from, and I know the ingredients that it takes for him to become that, uh, all the way down to the, the, the clothes, man. People talk about the fashion of Miles Davis sometimes. And, if you know people from this area, man, that's, you know, I'm in the house. I got all my chains on for what? For what? You know, like, <laughs> that's, just, <laughs> that's just St. Louis, man. <laughs> that's right. That's just yeah, how Saint, we do it. Man. St. Louis is the Harlem of the Midwest, man. Yeah, in man. In terms you know, of like the fashion, there's a boldness to it. There's a flyness to it. There's a certain like necessity of being clean. And it's a very specific type of clean. You know what I'm saying? To where like, you know, cats are flying yeah, in Brooklyn man. too, but Harlem is has a certain like pronounced type of fresh. You know what I'm saying? And St. Louis yeah. is definitely Louis like is that. Very man. much like that, dog. Like, yo, all the way to the point where like, it's crazy, man, because like uh, in the hip hop scene here, Part of the the battle of becoming a respected rapper mm -hmm. is people. If we can't respect how you dress, 
Right. It's like, yo, you you can rap, man, but I don't want to be you. <laughs> you that's know, right. that's right. Yeah. It ain't like you gotta be like, you know, doing, you know, all you know, all corny with all the designer and all that crap. If that's not you, don't do that. You know, right. just leave it alone. But you have to out here. This is a hemisphere where you got to be yourself, and you got to be the best version of you that you can be while doing that. And man, and people don't realize, I think, especially if you don't come from culture, like it's one of the universal things about culture that that the way you present yourself is a cultural statement. It's like I'm connect. It's like who I'm connected to, but it also is a you're communicating something with what you wear, and I think that's something that especially like white cats in hip hop. So I've noticed like. You know, a lot of times I've had DJs that are white, and shout out to BK1, who's the producer yeah. of this podcast. And he was never, this was never the case. But I'm saying, like, some of the white cats that I've toured with and been on stage with, it's like trying to get this understanding across as a really challenging, tricky thing. Because I think people don't realize that, like, okay, people talk about rappers wearing chains, and they don't necessarily realize, like, for somebody like Rakim, who's like five, six, maybe, you know what I'm saying, to wear, to wear those chains. It means that not only did I do something to be able to afford these, but I am somebody in this community where I can step out here and I am not worried about somebody stealing this. Like it shows something about my own, yeah. like standing with what I mean to the people here that I can walk around with this on. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And it, it's something that, that gets overlooked. But in every yeah. culture, except for people who lost their culture by trying trying to dominate other people, in every but but they had it in Europe, like those kilts weren't just like those kilts had a certain pattern on it, you know what I'm saying? In Scotland, Ireland, that that joint had a certain pattern that meant I'm from these people, and if you wear it a certain way, it meant it said about something about who you were in the community, and it's man, it's so deeply important, man, what a person wears and what it communicates. Man, what you're saying really connects to the culture for me in ways that people ain't tripping off of, yo. Because that is the 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 that is one of the quintessential political components of hip hop. Um, you mm -hmm. look at Rock Him, you also see an Eric B with Rock Him. Eric B is coming That's with right. the knowledge. I mean, Rock Him is coming yeah. with the knowledge, but Eric B is coming with the backbone that says, no, this is the order by which we the order in which we should be listening to is this man right here. Right, and right, right. if you thought he wasn't, I'm backing him up. Y'all know what I'm about and who I am out here. I'm backing him That's up right. on the wheels of steel. I yes, am sir. with him. There it is. <laughs> and to, on the wheels of steel and the chrome. With a 15 pound chain on your neck, man. And and and, and, and nobody say, yo, in a, in, a, in a land where everybody is hungry, you know, you got a 1% employment rate in some of these areas and you walking through with $20,000 worth of jewelry on in the 80s. And, yeah. and they and they, they like yo, it's cool, man. That that's that's political power. That's that's that's, that's, that's royalty. Crazy. I mean, we're basically oh, wow. saying like I'm royalty where I live, like where I live. I am a I am a a, a message and a messenger of my people, so I'm royal. I'm T'Challa where I'm. And that from. also goes back to uh, to me in, in Islam contextualization. It goes back to the doctrine of Mansa Musa. You know, like when. I didn't, I didn't know this until the brothers started in, educating me about different things. It's like, yo, uh, you have a question why men can't wear gold? I said, no, I never, never asked. Never asked, never asked. I thought it had something to do with humility. No, nah, man, some Musa came through here ruining the economy with gold. <laughs> and, when, and, when the, and when we started really reconvening things, <laughs> it made sense to be like, yo, we got to get a grasp on this. <laughs> Humble yourself. Mm. <laughs> mm. Amazing. You know, uh, Mensa Musa's brother, so Mensa is like the term for king. His name was Musa, and their family name is Khan Khan. So they were saying Mensa Khan Khan Musa. His brother was Mensa Khan Khan Abu Bakr. Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr also had, you know, the, the same lineage and the same access to the family provisions and things. He brought 25, there's records of 25,000 ships that they brought from West Africa yeah. to mm -hmm. what they now call uh, uh, mm -hmm. North America on those same mm -hmm. routes that they used in the slaving routes mm -hmm. long before Columbus ever came right. and that they right. had great interactions and dealings with the First Nations people. You know what I'm saying? Right. That there are there are like Mandinka and, and Wolof right. words that are also, you know what I'm saying, in, in a... Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And the cowrie shells and like all of this, these connections, man... So amazing, it's man! Crazy, man, and 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 it's 
for you got to think about it for the the uh, for the rest of the world listening to this. This is uh, how the a lot of the North American brothers that I know. Mm -hmm. These are the stories that they're leaning into, right. which to them validate the necessity uh, of Allah as the true God in their lives, because they see that this to them this is the lineage in which Islam comes to this portion of the world is through these hands and yeah. through these stories and people. So um, a lot of times I feel as if do, the Western world has done a good job of saying that maybe this didn't happen like that. Or <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, right, right. Allegedly. <laughs> but we can believe a lot of other crazy stuff as facts right. with, with, with no lineage... To proof whatsoever. So mm -hmm. uh, once again, man, I'm, I'm coming in under the birthright of these stories being relevant to me and, and having uh, some type of ability to spark my interest in, 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 in who I am and where I come from and uh, the majesty of who created the universe. Yeah. You know, it's deep too, is like I, I've... I'm really fortunate that I've been able to accompany a lot of white homies in their journey to becoming Muslim. You know what I'm saying? And like to, to be with them and support them and people from all walks of life. You know, there is like, you know, there are famous people that me and two other people are the only people that know they're, they're Muslim. And there's, yeah. you know, gay homies that me and a small handful of people, the ones that know that this person is Muslim, mm -hmm. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, mm -hmm. But a, a lot of white women and men that I know that have become Muslim and some mm -hmm. of them come from hip hop, but not all of them do. Some of them come mm. from like, they're very, very culturally white, but every single one of them that I know, they believe the oneness of the creator, all of the like universal principles of Islam, the oneness of the creator, the oneness of the human family, the, the reality of good, all of these things that we believe in, the reality of prophets and saints and, and, you know, wisdom and justice and mercy and all this stuff. But every single one of them, there's something in their, in them coming to Islam where they're like, this is me saying that the all of the myths that I've been told as a so-called white person, that I reject uh -huh. them. Like, I'll still try to, like, you know, Islam also is like, okay, uh, race is a science fiction, but a social reality. Just like money is made up, but you still got to be uh, re responsible with your money. If you have money, you got to use it well, you got to spend it well, you got to share it, you got to whatever. Okay, race is a made up lie. We're still going to be responsible with it. But we will right. be similar to what we were saying about the whole like like spiritual bypassing, being being uh, easily subjugated and stuff. When people come into this reality that like okay, the same way the Nation of Islam was saying the black man is a so called Negro, like don't just accept that the, whatever the white man named you, that's what you are, or like replacing the names with the X. The white people that I know that come in, the Caucasian European descendants of Europe that come into Islam, even the ones that don't come from the hood. Like, I don't know if you know, like, Omar Lee. Like, there's certain, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in St. Louis. I know Omar. Even, like, I know Omar. Yeah, so, like, Omar he's obviously a, from the hood. I don't know him. I've watched yeah. his videos. I'm like, that's a white man from the hood. I know that guy. I know that talk very well. Like, that, he makes a lot of sense to me. He's criticized a bunch of my friends, but it's like, man, I, I know this dude without yeah. knowing him. But I'm he'll not even talking about the Omar Lees of the spark, world. He'll spark it on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's fair. He's very fair. But, man... Every single person that I've known from the dominant culture that comes into Islam, there's something in there where they're like, I don't believe what this culture has said I am. Like I'm trying to be, I'm trying to really dig into this rehumanizing process. And something yeah. that there's almost like an apostasy from whiteness, where it's like, man, I'm an apostate from this, from this lie of whiteness. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. an amazing thing, man. We see it yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's all, it's all about trying to reconnect with uh, what it, with the real indigenous, what's really mm. indigenous to us. Uh, and when we start peeling back those layers and understanding, like, um, as uh, so-called blacks in, in the United States, man, we've been cut off from the language. We've been cut mm. off from the, uh, the cultural practitioners. Yeah. And, and when you start reinserting yourself into that, things mm -hmm. become really good. And, and if you look at a, a cat like Nipsey Hussle, even though he wasn't Muslim, uh, that's why he was dangerous. That's right. Because yes. you got this rolling 60 dude going 
physically, since he is African, he's going yeah. back to his homeland. Mm-hmm. He's engaging with his family. And he's becoming a symbol to that community yeah. across the pond and, and it's working vice versa both ways. Yeah. So now in in the sense of what's possible, a lot of revolutionary uh possibilities are there. Mm-hmm. And uh that's that's that becomes dangerous. That becomes dangerous. And when when you have a person who has a little less of a, a worldview that is Western world centric, <laughs> right. uh, a different set of values come into play with that. So now you have the world's number one rapper on the carpet of the Grammys with his wife and his daughter. He's not there with a posse of uh, 12 different dudes and with pistols and knives. No, he's he's very dignified representation of, of, of what the culture was designed to accomplish. And I do believe that you can accredit that to uh, the values that come from a different space outside of this world uh, for, for people like himself. Like, you know, and, I don't know him personally. Yeah, and and not only not only like the like not only the white supremacy part of it, but there's like a there's like a modernism supremacy too that comes along with white supremacy. And I don't, I, you know, how you have these ideas, and you, it's like I can't, I don't have the, the exact right language for this yet, but there is something connected to white supremacy that of this like this this superiority of modern people. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's tied in with the idea of evolution. And then like as Muslims, we're not anti-science. Like our, our people laid the foundation for science. So like we don't have mm-hmm. this like science versus religion thing. And everything in our religion can be backed up by science. It's like we 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 are the authors of science. Well, Allah is the author of creation. And by worshiping him and witnessing him, science is a spiritual act for us. But man... There's something about the idea of evolution, whereas like, you know, with with people getting further and further away from mama, which is Africa, and adapting to colder climates and becoming what now is called white. Just calling that evolution, like that adaptation automatically meant we were, we were getting better. But then mm-hmm. also this like devaluing of pre-modern people as though they're primitive and we're like socially evolving to where when people say stuff like, man, it's 2022 and we're still doing so-and-so, like you thought we were just getting better? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like the people of the past, when you look even at like ancient languages, like I, don't, I know this much Arabic, not much, but I know yeah. enough to know that like these pre-modern languages, we don't have language that can match it except for what black people have done with English and French and every other language where, where black people are. But like, we don't have a nuanced language time. like this. Yeah. I think about that all the time, yo, because I, 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 I beat myself up because mm. uh, when I do go back to the Arab world, the brothers, my comrades over there be like, come on, fam, you, you, you're supposed to know the language by now. <laughs> They're like, come on, right? So I used to beat myself up about it. But at the same time, I realized something. Uh, that's very connected to what you're saying is the fact that I actually have been speaking multiple languages all my life. Mm. The way, especially folks from my region of the world, mm-hmm. I could say a, a sentence in what I would consider English. And if I really say it with my native tongue, with the actual right clicks of how people actually talk out here, you wouldn't know what the heck I'm talking about. You wouldn't be able to translate that sentence if you didn't know that language. And uh, that exists all across this region. You go to Tennessee, you end up in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Mm. I'm not going to know what this dude is talking about. And he's going to look at me like, bro, I'm speaking directly to you. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Mm. It's just uh, we have really decomposed the King's English in many, many ways. Uh, And I think also uh, if it wasn't for hip hop, uh, the respectability of the language uh, would still be intact in many different ways, you know. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, man, we start traveling, you realize like what was lost, especially like you go to West Africa or Africa in general, but like, man, you start learning something about what it means to be a Mandinka, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Or or like what it means to be Fulani and the, all of the different, you know, clans and, and sub families mm-hmm. like within that and yeah. the order that they have and like just the deep civilized sanity that exists even after all these years of being colonized it's like what were these people like before white people had their way with them you know what i'm saying like yeah. what, what was it before that because even now 
There's just man. something, there's like a deep human sanity to those cultures that's like, man, man. you realize man. like this that's, is what was lost? Yeah. This is what was stolen? Yeah. Yeah. I think in the United States, places like St. Louis, places like Memphis, mm -hmm. uh, we still represent some of that. Um, Absolutely. Uh, places where, you know, we haven't been completely culturally colonized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm still doing local shows like, like I'm performing at Woodstock. I'm still watching more and more local artists born that I know uh, will be extremely relevant to this portion of the world, but maybe not so relevant mm. to the rest of the world. Uh, uh, and, and in the capitalist uh, scope of music, we teach people that there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with uh, uh, standing on business behind where you're from and being indigenously connected in a very specific way to the root of that soil. But up to me, a lot of that is connected to this, this, this uh, subversive energy of the arts yeah of where i'm from yeah and of how how do they cultivate people to be unique leadership to be unique uh practitioners of 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 the culture and what are the the, the the what are the responsibilities of a person that 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 community says okay cool you can be the rapper you can be one of our rappers People, well, what are my responsibilities as one of y'all rappers? Then? Right. Is it just to talk records and make sure everybody dances? Is it just to dress cool? Is it just to kind of piss off dudes in the neighborhood messing with their girls? Like, what is my actual agenda? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so, so you know, like that 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 to me is it's it's all connected in a way that we don't often get to connect because with in the capitalist hemisphere. You're taught if you stay home and do the things, you're useless. You know, you didn't become Meek Mill. You didn't become Lil Wayne. You're not Lupe Fiasco. You're not this person. You're yeah. not that person. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't put records out for Atlantic. It doesn't service the greater, uh, you know, just the mechanisms of, of, of capital deliverance. We don't, you know, you don't service that when you decide that uh, you, can, you can build it from a place where there are no things there to help you build it, you know? Um, so I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're connecting ourselves to uh, our brothers and sisters all the way over there in the other hemispheres of the world, not just Africa, but Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, Chile, Mexico, uh, you know, any place where uh, there are people with a message, people with talent, people with resilience that are oppressed and going through things, uh, and they're using their, what, what, what was naturally given to them to uh, weaponize their existence against that stuff, uh, you know, we're all the same people, basically. Can you tell me about the about this case you've been working on? Yeah, there's a brother named uh, Kevin Johnson. They executed him uh, Monday. Um, he um, it's kind of controversial, man. I'm anti-death penalty, but I understand um, uh, the nuance involved in, in everything. You know, no absolutes to you know stuff where it's life and death involved and people losing. The loved one, and you know, people losing their, you know, children losing their father, and so forth. But um, he killed the police officer, and the story goes, you know, an officer showed up at his house looking for him, and um, his uh, little brother ended up having a seizure at the scene and passed away. The guy Kevin Johnson retaliated on the officer whom he felt was the most. Uh, responsible for what had happened and killed him when he was 19 years old. Mm. Spent 20 years on death row. Developed a relationship with his own children. Um, became a grandfather over the course of time. There's been different scenarios of uh, very racialized situations in the state of Missouri where, you know, they've been merciful to uh, white young men who have found themselves in the same situation. There's a particular case that a lot of legal folks were using as an example of such. And um, the thing about it is it was just a politicized thing. We have a Republican governor and, you know, he wasn't elected to tend to a certain constituency. So mm -hmm. it was the calls for a clemency were damn near impossible. You know what I'm saying? So it was just fighting. a. a it was like a suicide mission from the jump, for real, for real, you know. So, you know, I know that 
for you, like so many of us, like there's like a cohort of us that are artists and we're also community organizers. I think about, you know, me and you and Immortal Technique and Jasiri X and, you know, Ill and, you know, so many people that do that. But so in a case like this, what does that mean for you as Tef Po, the artist, and, and Kareem, the, the man in the community? Like, what's your, what's your role in a, in, in a case like this one? Um, well, I'm always going to go against uh, the state no matter where they win. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, that's a, it's an interesting role that I'm going to play, though, because I don't necessarily lean into the intellectual nuance of the left the way that a, like, a innately pro-liberal person might. So... Uh, for me, uh, I start with the, first, the fact that I'm a man, um, I'm a human being, I have an, an assortment of human experiences, I have my own opinions, I have things that I'm passionate about, and then I have my own um, just social non-negotiables, you know what I'm saying? And um, that bleeds into my artistry in a way that's uh, different than most people because to some folks, I might be an outright political artist. To mm -hmm. some folks, then I think what's a little different to me as I've grown older is that my lifestyle is more outright political, but my music isn't always like the most politically driven. Even though where I'm from, uh, the way I talk, the way I say it, the, the, the beat selection, what I might name a song some of the uh, subversives of the different subliminals in my lyrics, uh, they'll know that there's politics in it no matter what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of get that from Nas. Uh, I'm a student of Nas and Pac and, and Cube. They used to always slide politics and stuff even, even when it wasn't about nothing political. I'm talking to a different um, constituency than the average rap artist, I feel, even the average political artist, I feel. Because it's uh, my job to kind of be the aerial support for the streets, you know what I'm saying, in terms of how do I take Palestine and make these cats that don't really know what's going on over there understand what's going on over there? How do I bring the uh, draft the symmetry between these two worlds uh, where there might be some connectors, but there's a difference of ideologies and different things? And so how that breaks down in instances like this uh, with the Kevin Johnson cases, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's simple. I am uh, just a vessel. I'm, I'm just another community member who is supposed to show up and do a job. I just have a certain platform. I have a little bit more provocative of an opinion publicly, they may, they may believe, just because I'm an artist and stuff. It, you know, it's not always easy either, because like I said, I'm a portal for so much different stuff. So uh, I simplified my, my role in these moments by just saying that uh, I'm here to throw down uh, pretty much with, like Huey P said, with anybody that's uh, going against the state. If you're going against the same, the same opposition that I'm going against, then I'm here to, to throw down. Travelers Podcast is sponsored this week by BetterHelp Online Therapy Platform. And when you use our code to sign up with them, uh, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers. When you use that link to sign up with them, you get a discount uh, in accessing amazing therapists uh, that are qualified and licensed and come from that community of of uh group learning, communal learning, examination, and then also accountability. You know, you could find people on the internet that'll be like, well, I'm in the field of mental wellness and, you know, holistic way. And it's like, okay, that might be true. Uh, are you a licensed therapist? Because there's something that really comes along with that process. You know, my wife is a therapist. A lot of our friends are therapists. There's something that comes along. It doesn't mean that your auntie or somebody can't say something to you that's therapeutic, 
But if we're going to be talking to people, it's really good to talk to people who there's a licensure process that they had to go through. There's a community that holds each other account uh, accountable and that their livelihood is attached to, uh, you know, being in good standing with a community. I believe that there's value in that. So when you use that link, betterhelp.com slash travelers, you get a discount and then also we get a commission and they support the work that we do here on the Travelers Podcast. BetterHelp is really good because so many of us talk about therapy and we hear a lot about it on social media and a lot of us have these hangups. It's weird. It's a weird idea. Like I'm going to go talk to a total stranger about the most about the most like intimate, vulnerable, secret things about me. You know what I'm saying? Like it feels a counterintuitive. And in some, in a lot of ways, I really understand that. You know what I'm saying? There was a long time where I thought the idea of therapy was cool, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it because it, fe- it didn't feel right to me. And my wife being a therapist and so many of my friends being therapists gave me great advice, said, talk to a therapist and just talk to them. You don't have to tell them your secrets right away. You don't have to give them specifics. You can just talk to them about some of the just general kind of issues that you have and only give them, only tell them what you feel comfortable telling them, like talk to them until, and if you start to feel a sense of trust for them then share with them based on what your gut and your heart are telling you to share. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to, like, it's not like the movies where you lay on the couch and you're like, and then my mother did this and then this happened to me. And it's not, it didn't have to be like that if that's not what you want to do. You know, I went to my therapist, when I, I got on BetterHelp and I found out about them on a podcast. I live in Turkey, so I can't just go, I can't, most therapists in America, their license isn't going to cover them treating me living in Istanbul you know what I'm saying? Like as a Turkish therapist, how do I even find a Turkish therapist? I don't know how to do that. They don't speak English here. You know what I'm saying? They might not understand when I talk about the particular stuff I've been through. They might not even know what that is. So I tried it and I just, I wasn't giving specifics right away. I said, I said you know, the therapist asked me, what are the things that are bringing you to therapy? And I just started out with general themes in my life. Well, I'm like, well, I find this pattern where I do this and this and this with certain people and I give this and then I never communicate that. And then these relationships fall apart and I end up feeling abandoned and blah, 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 blah. And so she was like, okay, you, you shared a lot. Thank you for sharing that. And I didn't tell her anything personal. And she said, how do you feel when these relationships fall apart? I feel blah, 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 boom, 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 boom. You know, I, I feel invalidated. She said, okay, well, if just, you know, showing you what you said to me from an opposite way, if, if when these relationships break down, you feel invalidated, and I'm like, oh, I was looking for the, the relationship to validate me. And then she just said, is it, is it good for somebody to look for another person to validate them? No. She's like, do you think it's possible? For an, a person to validate another person? No. Meaning like convey to me my value as a human being? Can that come from somebody else? Probably not. I don't know, but probably not. I didn't tell her detail one. I didn't tell y'all detail one. I didn't tell you any detail. It's not like this person said this and did that. And da, da, da. I'm just talking about general principles, feelings, and experiences that and things that I'm having happen in life. That's how I started. And then over time, then as I started to trust her and I realized like, oh man, you've got some tools that you don't need to know every single thing about me. You've got some tools in just how people tend to interact with each other because you do this for a living and you're connected to a tradition of people that have done it for a living. You know what I'm saying? I say all this to say that uh, therapy is something that we can do on our own terms. And one of the things that I like about BetterHelp is that that's a platform that really puts the, the, the client or the seeker in the driver's seat. So you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers. You'll start with a questionnaire that asks you, why do you think you might want to come to therapy? The reality is that if you do make a good connection and you dig in, you're probably going to end up all up and through all, all these different parts of your life that you never even expected to. But all in due time, you don't got to do that right away. 
You find a person that you feel like you have a good rapport with and you trust them first. And, you know, also all this stuff is confidential. It's part of the reason that you talk to a licensed therapist, because if they via if it's shown that they violate that privacy, they can lose their license for that. And their whole life work and all their training is out the window. So they have more reason to, to be respectful of your privacy uh, you know, it's, it's directly connected to their livelihood because of the fact that they got that license, you know what I'm saying? So it puts you in a driver's seat. You go in and you tell them, what am I coming to therapy for? What type of therapist do I want to see? Then you go into the calendar, you choose the time, you choose how you connect. And if you talk to a person, you're like, eh, I don't think that that's the person for me. No questions asked. You just change. And you find somebody else. You start looking through different profiles and find somebody you want to give it a shot with. And you can do that as many times as you want. You can just change therapists. And again, because they're professionals, they're not going to take it personal. They're just going to understand this is a process of connecting with each other. So go to betterhelp.com slash travelers podcast and expose yourself to the opportunity and to the possibility of benefiting from this body of knowledge, this body of wisdom, this body of experience, and do it on your own terms. Uh, we're grateful to be partnering with BetterHelp. So I want to be respectful of your time. Do you, are you, are you good? I, I want to ask I, you- I, I, got mad, I got mad time. Man. Okay, okay, you know, this, okay. We were supposed to make this happen, so I carved it out. Man. And it's so it's so corny that we've never like toured together or like oh yo can like you imagine just, that? yeah man I'm saying can you we, imagine yeah we can you imagine something. bro can you imagine no. I know the fans so many of the fans have got on my head about me and you not working bro it's crazy people come to me all the time uh they're like yo what where are you and brother Ali gonna do anything bro like <laughs> yeah it's really it's really bizarre. It's really bizarre. It's like, yeah, man. But you know, the, the crazy part of how the game works, bro, um, I've been in this hip hop thing a long time in the underground, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the real, real underground fans out there, they know, you know? Yeah. Um, from rocking out with my homie, Bamboo, Killer Mike. I was just thinking Bamboo's name. And when I mentioned the real organizers, yeah. I was thinking about Bamboo and Rocky Rivera, some of the realest on yeah, earth. Yeah, oh, they the realest, man. I love them. But, uh, you know, Bam took me on tour. I, I was able to... My situation has, has been spread by guys like that. Bam, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Killer Mike, Immortal Technique, Poison Pen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Excel. Uh, very specifically, uh, Talib Kweli and Yasin. Mm -hmm. um, these are just people I can call that, you know, um, they know I'm trying to do something very specific and they never close the doors on me. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed in those regards. The big homies, man. The, I love these brothers. Dead Prez. I love them. Love them. I'm a, I'm a, a direct student lineage of Dead Prez. If you want to understand what the, the, the 2000 millennial version- Revolutionary of, but gangster. Of a kid who grew up listening to Dead Prez. Yes, I know sir. every lyric. That's my trap music. You know what I'm saying? Like Stickman is a, a very unique MC to me, man. He's he's a, he's a more than an MC. He's a a, a, a man that, that I think we we all should look at as an example. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? When Stick is in the room, I can feel the power of, yes. of, of a cat. That you know he can arguably break everybody's neck in the room. That's right. But yeah. he, he comes with a calmness yes. that that's not even the energy that he evokes. Uh, but it, but at the same time, he ain't here for no 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 pushover activities. So I really uh, you know I, I try to model myself after after those types of uh, after those types of energies. Well, man, one of the things that's so so dope to me is like you know being in a situation that we find ourselves in where. You know, we're we're somebody in our community. We have a mission. We have a message. Like we're very clear about what we're doing, and we know that the music is, you know, it maybe it's not going commercially where you know somebody else might want it for our music to go. But man, it, it can be challenging to just keep, just to keep existing and just to keep putting out music. And your your musical output, your artistical like contribution, is really profound. And man, I feel like 
you're continuing to really grow as an artist. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. the Nine Project. And I, I think War Machine 3, either that or Preacher and a Trap are like my two mm -hmm. favorites. Mm -hmm. Wow, but, man. Appreciate it. But I'm saying, but man, you're doing things on Nine that you've never done before. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like conceptually and also styles and all this. Like, mm -hmm. like you still, your music still really feels like this is a, like with all the other things that you are in the world. And I know they're all connected, but like this is somebody that's inspired, somebody that's mm -hmm. like still trying to grow, somebody that's still yeah. excited to be making this music. Like there's still like very like tangible excitement in the music. Whereas like for a lot of people, man, when when we're opposed the way we are, overlooked the way we are, overshadowed, ignored, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it can be discouraging for and a lot of people just lose their drive. Yeah. But man, yeah, yeah. you as an artist, along with all the other things, man, are are like your 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 fire and your energy and your creative your like creative spark. Your sword is as sharp as ever. I think yeah. sharper than ever. I think you're making it, your best I, work now. And I, I'm gonna send you some stuff that that I that, that I haven't put out, man. That's even crazier because now um, I'm not even cussing in my music no more. So I've eliminated. Uh, profanity from my lyrics completely in the in the records that I hope to release in the future. Man. And you may hear some stuff uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm letting people know right now, you know what I'm saying? And I ain't even said this to nobody publicly because I just wanted to do it without making a profound statement about it. But uh, if you hear anything with me cursing in it, it was already recorded before I made this decision. That's but, right. Because uh, I mean, I did something very similar a few years ago. What's your, what's your... Yeah. Like what? What? What's your uh, unpack that a little bit? What's your reason for oh, doing that? Oh man, 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 man. Um, it's a lot of things, man. Um, I've been making music for a while, and I wanted to push myself to a space where I felt I was seeing more with my pen, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of putting an F you here and an F you there. I, I really didn't fully describe how I felt, and uh, then I started to cringe. At some of my own lyrics when I would hear certain things and be like, ah, oh, man, you know, you, that, that just doesn't represent who I really am in, in totality. Uh, then I have, you know, um, nieces and nephews, man. And, and like the, the, it's not a moral issue as much as it is a, uh, I just believe the art was created for us to really use it to express ourselves in the, in a more unique way. And, uh, after you become a certain tier of lyricist, mm -hmm. it you it it becomes really formulaic for you. Your writing approach becomes formulaic, and uh, it, it, it's just I was hearing lyrics and looking at lyrics and reading lyrics and listening to songs of mine, and I just knew that if I uh, did certain things, there was another level for me that I could, you know, tap on the glass and crack, and uh, also. I just don't need it. It's it's a lot of these people need. There you go. Uh, there it is. The profanity, you know. I just mm -hmm. don't need it. I just don't need it. It's a. I, I could be more poetical. At the end of the day, uh, uh, I'm trying to write poetry. It just happens to have music on it. So uh, that's how I wanted to come about it for real, man. Just expand, expand the subject matter, expand my own skills, and really. Let's see what a new world of, of possibilities looks like with, with my discussions. You know, it's, it's ill, man. I started to realize that, um, so I knew that my Muslim teachers never liked it. They always supported me in my music, and I know they never liked it. And it's a trip, because when I first met Evidence from <laughs> people who become, become one of my dearest friends, when I first met man, him, he was just cute. cracking up laughing. And I was like, what's so funny, man? What are you laughing at? Because, you know, you never around another rapper you never met before, like, what's so funny, man? And he's like, yo, I was like, I was just talking to Rocco about you. And uh, he said, man, for being a conscious rapper, Brother Ali curses more than a gangster rapper. Wow. And he, <laughs> he said, he told me the first time I met him, he's like, you're overcompensating because of the fact that you're out here on tour, trying to mix a lot, trying to mind your business when it comes to women. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Not doing this, not doing that, not doing... So he's like, you're overcompensating trying to let people know that you're not soft by cursing so much. And he's like, it's, but he's like, it's not really who you are. It doesn't even sound right. Someday you're going to you're gonna stop. And I'm like, dude, because he cusses like crazy. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. after a while, I started feeling like... It started feeling like, um, especially 
once I started really being like, okay, I'm going to really commit myself to the spiritual path, even to like what I, what I'm thinking about. Cause then you start getting, you know, on the beads with the beads that you have certain like mantras that you say over and over again, cause you're trying to reset the system of your, of your thinking in your heart. So like you're reciting the names of Allah or certain prayers or certain th things that you're trying to bring into your being. And I started thinking like, man, so if I'm on the mic saying, or even in life, and all of these curse words are just almost like making dhikr or making a mantra out of body functions and loveless sex and, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like all these yeah. things are just very low ideas. Yeah. yeah. It started yeah, feeling like it started feeling like verbal smoking too, where like, so when I stopped saying them and stopped having so much of that in my just diet, my like thought and heart diet, I start realizing that when I'm with people that talk like that, it's like smoking, where where like it feels cool to them, it feels good to yeah. them, but the same way that if you're in a room with somebody and they're smoking, you have no choice but to smell like smoke and to breathe smoke. Like when somebody else says it, you you the person that listens to you has no choice. Like they that's our, that's my frequency now. Mm, mm. See, man, for me, my my whole uh, approach to hip hop mm -hmm. as an MC, I feel it's crazy to hear you you say this because I really feel like you're one of the only people who get who you just off of this the, the brief little things that you've thrown out there. You you get it and. Uh, it's wild because somebody might not even expect you to fully understand what, some, what, a, what a dude like me is trying to do musically sometimes. Even though we probably have to like the same message at the root of it, they might listen to me and go, ah, oh, that's an element of, uh, you know what I'm saying, counter-revolutionary behavior in some of, some of the stuff he's talking about. You could possibly, if you wanted to find it, you could find it. Right, right. And, right. Uh, but I think um, also what I've made the decision to do, honestly, is take my music and really uh, be true to my um, my influences, my 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 lived experiences and my influences. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm one of those people. Who I was we listened to Puffy and and Kanye. We listened to. Uh, uh, Talib and Brother Lynch hung, you know, um, I know about the depths of the underground. So I, used to listen, I have listened to a lot of rap music, various styles, various genres. I can go mm. from violated peoples to uh, gangsta boo. You know what I'm saying? Like I can really go there with you on that. Right. And a lot of people are hip hop heads, but it, it has a ceiling for them. So like, uh, I, t I pride myself on I'm able to be in this business in the underground so thoroughly because I can do records with every freaking body. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like I enjoy being in that space, and and it's but 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 the thing about being in that space is you now put yourself in a position where you really have to work on your skills at a hyper accelerated pace more than a, the average cat that's a conscious MC because. Uh, Coming from St. Louis, my direct influences would be the the Gucci Mans and the Master P's and the uh, the you know there's a brother from No Limit Records that don't get hardly no credit, but the actual real life political prisoner by the name of Mac is out free. Dropped two of the best albums I ever heard in my life on No Limit Records. Had a mm. song called Genocide. Uh, he was like Nas meets juvenile and 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 amazing mc one of the best mcs of all time in my opinion uh just recently released mm. from prison uh for a murder that a lot of people in new orleans pretty much uh publicly acknowledged that he didn't commit uh but they sent him to jail after the release of his sophomore album so he never really got to fulfill what he was trying to complete in hip-hop so i see myself as an extension of those types of rappers like the stylist the dudes who who could rap but just so not to happen to be from a particular hot spot. So that means mm -hmm. that uh, I would have to have my flow together, but I would al I also have to have my music together. I have to have my music together. And, and this is a hemisphere where they, they care about rap. 
but they don't care about rap in the classic sense. They care about the music. So uh, when you listen to Nine, man, what I'm trying to accomplish on that is uh, I felt like that was a uh, me parting ways with particular things in my style. I knew I was going to stop cursing after a while. I knew uh, even though I'm coming out rapping about politics, I'm not trying to make personal enemies. I'm trying to address the issues. And mm-hmm. I also, I'm also not trying to make music that uh, people who uh, know these things are real. I don't make Black Lives Matter rap. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All the people. <laughs> like, straight up. <laughs> for the love of God. For the love of God. Everybody out there, stop. Stop sending me your Black Lives Matter rap record. I don't want them. I don't want to do them. <laughs> Half y'all have never even heard me say the phrase Black Lives Matter and you're sending me these records. It's it's crazy. Well, I, I mean, don't do also, they're not paying attention to your own, you know, just dialogue between, <laughs> you know, within the world of organizing activism. I just, I've never made that type of music, man. Even if I did, even though when I'm making that type of music, I'm making music by burning this thing down. I'm busting at the system at all times. I'm not the police reform rapper. I'm not the angry black man rapper. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a revolutionary rap artist, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, uh, I just happen to be one of those who can really rap. You know what I'm saying? I don't need the genre. I'm not relying on the genre to right, justify right. my space. You know what I mean? Like yes. a lot of conscious rappers are relying on the genre to justify yes. their space. Yeah. And, and, it, and there's a political, there, there's like a, a psychological blackmail to that where like, yes. I'm for the people because if you love the people, yes. then you got to like my rapping, whether I'm good yes. or not, whether I'm corny or not. The same thing happens. <laughs> there's like Muslim poets, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that get up at the Muslim yeah, event yeah. and they're just like, my love for the prophet Muhammad yeah. means so-and-so. And it's like, man, if you love the prophet Muhammad, so I tell him, you got to love me too. Like, nah, man, yeah, disagree man. with that. Yeah, I feel you a thousand percent. Right. But man, in the real sense, dog, I'm the uh, I'm one of those. It never gets told in hip hop because mm-hmm. we never get to speak on this part of the the genre because it's not as commercial as anything else. But I am a, uh, a an alumni. I am a child of the Brother Ali's. I am a child of the Dead Prezes. If these people never exist, you don't get to me in the lineage of rap. Uh, it's sort of like how. Uh, Tupac had an interview and they said, you know, what happens if they take you out the game? And he said, uh, he stopped. He was at gun range. He said, oh, if they take me out the game, you don't want to see what happens because the mm-hmm. people after me are going, they're going to be way more heartless than I am. I'm what happens when you attempt to blackball Yasin Bey, when you when you cut off Dead Prez, who dropped stellar, amazing records yeah. that could have changed the whole trajectory of the yes. whole genre. Yes. And what happens when you when you when you when you tell Brother Ali, yo, you got the right message, but we're not going to let you in like this. I am mm-hmm. the, the child that was born out of the matriculation of the work that the, this this group of rappers did. Mm-hmm. And when y'all said conscious rap couldn't do it and didn't right. have it, uh, I, I was I, I'm the guy that was coming after them and taking this piece from this guy, taking this piece from this one, taking this piece from this one, and then mixing it up with that gumbo of that that Scarface that. That uh that gangster rap concoction mixed with that uh you know that the East Coast you know waving on the beats the what they were doing up there in Minneapolis with the business practicalities of under, underground hip hop mm-hmm. uh, Kansas City you know I'm just the the, the guy I'm I'm just one of those kids that was that was coming up and listening to all this stuff and I said I'm gonna put this in in my uh, notebook is what what it takes to pull this stuff off. You know. What have I'm you have you ever connected with uh, Tech Nine or, or Chris Calico or any of those cats? I know they're like down the street from uh, you. I met Tech a couple times, man. Um, met Tech and Chris. Chris probably wouldn't remember me as much as Tech would. I met Tech. Uh, Tech came to one of my uh, shows uh, when I first started rapping on a regional level. Uh, bought two of my CDs. Um, you know, that was a big deal back then. There was a picture of us on the internet floating around. Um, we never did no music together, which I would love to do. But uh, yeah, we definitely met a couple times. Yeah, I just wonder, um, you know, the the you mentioned the business in Minneapolis. And I mean, Tech 9 definitely has his own, like his own approach, like his own business approach that 
you know, is a, a really like powerful, amazing one. Like it, Tech Nine had to fight so hard to be recognized for the lyricist and the artist that he yeah. is. So many of us yeah. in the underground are like, well, you know, I got my fans. I can go on tour. I'm living off my music. I'm probably not going to have a Grammy, but, you know, yeah. I'm living off my music, so I should just be happy. Tech Nine was like, no, you're going to recognize that I'm nice. I don't care if, like, you're going to you're gonna know that I'm nice. But I feel like, you know, his uh, business acumen doesn't, it, like, I, I think there's still recognition come, to come that's coming to him for that. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's not yeah. totally. That's not different from a Master P or like him as a black businessman is is a still untold story. I think. Yeah, I also don't think the uh, what you know as a person from Missouri that a lot of people don't know is the how many people have came through that machine. Mm. Uh, you know, J Rock and Kendrick Lamar both uh, spent some substantial time around Tech Nine. Mm. Uh, J Rock was actually signed to Tech Nine for a little bit. I don't know the mechanics of the deal, but he was with Strange for a split second. Um, tech is a, a a pillar in terms of uh, somebody who myself I looked at him as something that not that I was competing with, but uh, it was just the, the the standard in which we wanted to manifest. Like if he could pull that off in Kansas City, mm -hmm. why can't we build something similar in St. Louis? Uh, and I, I, you know, so we were, we've always been chasing strange music in my opinion. Yeah, man. And they're, they're like, he's such a great brother, man. He's so supportive of artists on every level. Like, man, I, I did a joint with him. Like he's always, always been beautiful, but man, I, we played one time at the um, hip hop Kemp festival, which is like, it might be the biggest hip hop festival in the world in the Czech Republic mm. of all places. And mm. For whatever reason, you know, like most festivals, when the headliner goes on the main stage, that's the end of the night. They had me headlining the side stage and they put me on right after Tech Nine. And I'm yeah. saying, I'm like, man, I'm nice. But like it was tech. That's when Chris Calico was still playing with him. And I'm like, oh, man, I better really, you know, what I'm saying I'm going to have to wait till after the show to eat all the pizza that I've been like, I'm going to have to go on this thing hungry because like, man, this guy. And um so my set was on the side stage 15 minutes after his set. And so we're getting to go on. And man, he pulled up in a, him and Chris Calico pulled up on a golf cart that they had sitting there waiting because they were like, they jumped directly off stage, headlining the main stage and came over to my thing, makeup still on, sweat and still had the, you know, the, the red dicky suits on. Because not only did they want to watch my set, but they needed me to know that they were going to be there watching me on the small stage. Just like, hey, man, we love you. We're here to support you. We know you're going to kill it. You know what I'm saying? And people are like, yo, Tech Nine, can you take a picture? He's like, man, I'm here to watch Brother Ali. Like, man, you don't have to do that. You know what I mean? That's amazing. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember, yo, uh, when I first started to jump around, me and my boy DJ Trackstar, who uh, oh yeah, now DJ for uh, Run The Jewels. Yeah, uh, I used to be the DJ for like when I first started rapping for my underground group back there. Okay, and uh, we were—I think we might have been in Bloomington, Illinois, or I mean, Bloomington, Indiana, or something. And uh, you were on the bill of the show we were rocking, or stand, or either staying like in the same place we were staying or something. And uh, I remember uh, just watching you just get in the car, leave, whatever, whatever. And then we were all like, "Dang, that's Brother Ali, dog." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, and uh, those types of moments always resonate to me now in my career because the truth is uh, when you're coming into rap, you don't realize how much of an industry you're coming into. Mm. Uh, and you get to see who has stand power, who leaves, who comes around. Then, you know, you start hearing different things about different people. You know, different people have different same friends you have. You might have a homie over here that's homies with this cat or whatever. And then, you know, you just hear different things. And then it's like, yo, um, some cats you hear about and it's like you, you'll be a lifelong fan of them. And then it's like that's where it stops. It just stops with that. You know, it's it's, it's nothing more to their humanity. They're not really uh, the person that they're professing themselves to be on these records a lot of times especially in the revolutionary rap world. Oh, my goodness. Lot. Yeah, man. And, uh, but, man, you've always been a person that, you know what I'm saying, uh, um, like, we, you know, we said there's no smut on the name, man. You ain't really got no smut on your name, bro. I mean, the, the most solid 
cats in this thing on that level all got respect for you. You know, it, it it's 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 wild because like uh, it, it it's it's something that's consi- it consistently checks out. You know what I'm saying? It's never like so nobody's <laughs> like, oh, bro, Ali, man, that dude. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, I appreciate you so much, brother. The the building I'm in, so it's almost midnight here in Istanbul. Oh, love, and bro, at, love. at midnight, the the building where my studio and my office is, they yeah. automatically cut a an alarm on. So if I leave after oh, midnight, love, love. the alarm goes off, and it. Yeah. I'm not really worried because, man, the police here, it's crazy, man. The police here just have conversations with people. Like I've never yeah. seen the police really man. do anything crazy. They just show up and just be like, "Hey, what's going on?" Um, man. But I, it wakes up the the people in the neighborhood when I do that. So, Word, man. man, but I appreciate you. And um, man, it's such a blessing to finally connect. I feel like it's just the beginning. Oh. Yeah, definitely, man. Like it's, it's it's definitely just the beginning, man. It's definitely just the beginning. Uh, in part, man, I just want to say thank you, man, because like a lot of people don't realize, man, that we're, uh, like I said earlier, my generation of underground conscious hip hop they purged our heroes and took our heroes through so much stuff that we never really got to come into the commercial spaces that I have been let in and even say, yo, I am stylistically concretely connected to this cat. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? They might hear the pimp C in my stuff. They might hear my Southern rap influences, but sometimes they never connect the political guys who, 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 who concretely played a role in designing the MC like me to me. So, uh, for me, it's important to be able to say that because it's a real thing. It's a real history and there's a real lineage attached to all of this stuff that people need to understand. Yeah, man. Yeah. We have, we got a lot that we have a lot in front of us. Like we definitely <laughs> have an important, we have an important uh, calling and affair together. I don't know exactly what it looks like yet, but I know it's there. And it's dope to even just like have this podcast as like an excuse to, to, for as, as much as like we've reached out to each other over the years, like, yo, let's connect, yeah, let's yeah. connect, let's connect. And just for one reason or another, it never really happened the way we want. This is the first time yeah. that we actually sat down for a couple hours and just, just got to build for a minute. It's crazy, it's and it's just crazy. confirmation. It's just confirmation. Like, I know this brother. You know what I mean? Like, I know this crazy. guy. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. It's a blessing. Man. I really appreciate you, though, for real. Yeah, man. I love you. admire you beyond words. And um, I just appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you, too, King. All right, family. Peace, peace. Special thanks to my dear brother, Tef Poe, for being so generous with his time and his wisdom and just his experience and his presence. Uh, this is definitely somebody, I'm sure you can hear it, that like certain people you feel like you're already friends with them. And when you get together, it's just proof. You know what I mean? It's just proof of what you already knew. It's proof of concept. So it was really dope, really fun. I felt very comfortable just sitting and talking with my brother and really hoping that we can connect you know, so don't be surprised if you see us on tour together. Don't be surprised if you hear us making music together, um, you know, on any level. If you have not listened to Tef Poe's music, please go and check it out. Now that you've heard our conversation and you get a sense of where he's coming from, um, he's got a lot of dope music. And to me, his later projects are his best ones. But I do have to say, uh, Tef Poe has a song called Bullet that is like, man, I'll put right next to any other artist from his genre of music. I'll put that next to any big crit. I'll put it next to any UGK. I'll put it next to any, you know what I'm saying? Super dope. So special thanks to my man, Tef Poe. And uh, go and check him out. Follow him on social media. Support him. If he does shows in your area, go to the shows. If you see him selling merch, buy that merch. Stream the music. Share it. This is really an opportunity for us to cultivate a community of people that are that are living, that are attempting in every moment to grow into their best selves, live their best purpose, to leave the world better than they found it, to cultivate beautiful things. And, and so we contribute to that by just supporting, by engaging, by practicing community together. That's what this podcast is about. So much love to Tef Poe. Uh, make sure that you go to brotherali.com. Speaking of which, go to brotherali.com. Check out all the stuff that we're doing there. Uh, we've 
are doing our online learning series, Blood on Beats, where we talk about spend one month together in real intimate interactive space with a small group of people digging into writing songs, everything from, you know, just the basics of how rap music works to uh, really digging into ourselves and exploring, expressing ourselves, having this kind of spiritual experience and how it can connect people that never met each other. And um, just the beauty and the incredible practice of writing a song, really dope thing. So check that out. Uh, Brother Minister, my one minute freestyle series that I do. I'm, I drop those all the time, but we made a collection of them last year called Brother Minister Volume One. These like self-produced one minute freestyles that I put on social media whenever I just want to drop music without having to think too much about it. Uh, we did vinyl for that that sold out immediately last year when it did it, but we put on streaming services that hit a million streams just on Spotify. I, I don't even have the analytics for all the other sites, but on Spotify, that joint is over 1 million streams. And so we put it out on cassette tape. So on brotherali.com, you can see Brother Brother Minister Volume 1 cassette tapes. There's a merch for this podcast, you know what I'm saying? This dope design that uh, the brother Mark from Medina Hip Hop made uh, these stamps. He's got a whole series of stamps that he made, starting with Chuck D, because Chuck D said, most of my heroes don't appear on no stamp. And so Mark and Medina said, I'm going to make a stamp with Chuck D on it. And that's what he did. And then ended up doing a full line of them. And I'm very, very grateful and honored to be part of that line. And my stamp is the logo for the Travelers podcast. So much love to Mark from Medina. Make sure to check out what he's doing and check out the merch that we have for the podcast on brotherali.com. Much love to Zakat Foundation, to Better Help Online Therapy Platform, uh, Amna Mirna, Mansur Panawala, DJ Last Word, my man Ant, Darian Washington, uh, to the whole, shout out to the caravan. If you go to brotherali.com slash join in the join section, we've got a caravan of subscribers, that top tier uh, the trailblazers are actually a real community that really communicate with each other. They've kind of become like a support group for me. We're a support group for each other, you know what I'm saying? But shout out to that whole crew as well. Uh, the fam, everybody that contributes to this podcast in whatever way that you do, uh, make sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notifications, rate, all that good stuff. Uh, we love you beyond words. We appreciate you. Thank you for making this podcast a reality by listening to it. And we will see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.